Theorites, Tales of One Thousand and One Nights Volume 3 By Anonymous Author Audiobook 66x69 Sitting down on his sofa, fa, he placed the box in front of him and uncovered it. After he had prepared and leveled the sand with the intention of discovering if Aladdin had died in the cave, he made his throw, interpreted the figures and drew up the horoscope. When he examined it to ascertain its meaning, instead of discovering that Aladdin had died in the cave, he found that he had got out of it and that he was living in great splendor, being immensely rich, he had married a princess and was generally honored and respected. As soon as the magician had learned through the means of his diabolic art that Aladdin lived in such a state of elevation, he became red with rage. In his fury, he exclaimed to himself, That wretched son of a tailor has discovered the secret and power of the lamp. I took his death for a certainty and here he is enjoying the fruit of my labors and vigils. But I will stop him enjoying them much longer, or die in the attempt. He did not take long in deciding what to do. The next morning, he mounted a Barbary horse which he had in his stable and set off, traveling from city to city and from province to province, stopping no longer than was necessary so as not to tire his horse, until he reached China and was soon in the capital of the Sultan whose daughter Aladdin had married. There he dismounted in a Khan or public hostelry, where he rented a room and where he remained for the rest of the day and the night to recover from his tiring journey. The next day, the first thing the magician wanted to find out was what people said about Aladdin. Walking around the city, he entered the best known and most frequented place, where the most distinguished people met to drink a certain hot drink asterisk which was known to him from his first journey. As soon as he sat down, a cup of this drink was poured and presented to him. As he took it, he listened to the conversation going on around him and heard people talking about Aladdin's palace. When he had finished his drink, he approached one of them, singling him out to ask him. What's this palace everybody speaks so well of? To which the man replied. Where are you from? You must be a newcomer not to have seen or heard talk of the palace of Prince Aladdin that is how he was now called since he had married Princess Badr. I am not saying it is one of the wonders of the world, I say it is the only wonder of the world, for nothing so grand, so rich, so magnificent has ever been seen before or since. You must have come from very far away not to have heard talk of it. Indeed. The whole world must have been talking about it ever since it was built. Go and look at it and see if I'm not speaking the truth. Excuse my ignorance, said the magician. I only arrived yesterday and I have indeed come from very far away in fact the furthest part of Africa, which its fame had not yet reached when I left. For in view of the urgent business which brings me here, my sole concern in traveling was to get here as soon as possible without stopping and making any acquaintances. I knew nothing about it until you told me. But I will indeed go and see it, and so great is my impatience that I am ready to satisfy my curiosity this very instant, if you would be so kind as to show me the way. The man the magician had spoken to was only too happy to tell him the way he must take to have a view of Aladdin's palace, and the magician rose and immediately set off. When he reached the palace and had examined it closely and from all sides, he was left in no doubt that Aladdin had made use of the lamp to build it. Without dwelling on Aladdin's powerlessness as the son of a simple tailor, he was well aware that only jinn, the slaves of the lamp which he had failed to get hold of, were capable of performing miracles of this kind. Stung to the quick by Aladdin's good fortune and importance, which seemed to him little different from the Sultan's own, the magician returned to the Khan where he had taken up lodging. He needed to find out where the lamp was and whether Aladdin carried it around with him, or whether he kept in some secret spot, and this he could only discover through an act of geomancy. As soon as he reached his lodgings, he took his square box and his sand which he reached his lodgings, he took his square box and his sand which he carried with him on all his travels. When he had completed the operation,
he found that the lamp was in Aladdin's palace and he was so delighted at this discovery that he was beside himself. I am going to have this lamp, he said, and I defy Aladdin to stop me from taking it from him and from making him sink to the depths from which he has risen to such heights. Unfortunately for Aladdin, it so happened that he had set off on a hunting expedition for eight days and was still away, having been gone for only three days. This is how the magician learned about it. Having performed the act of geomancy which had given him so much joy, he went to see the doorkeeper of the Khan under the pretext of having a chat with him. The latter, who was of a garrulous nature, needed little encouragement, telling him that he had himself just been to see Aladdin's palace. After listening to him describe with great exaggeration all the things he had seen which had most amazed and struck him and everyone in general, the magician said. My curiosity does not stop there and I won't be satisfied until I have seen the master to whom such a wonderful building belongs. That will not be difficult, replied the doorkeeper. When he is in town hardly a day goes by on which there isn't an opportunity to see him, but three days ago, he went out on a great hunting expedition which was to last for eight days. The magician needed to hear no more. He took leave of the doorkeeper, saying to himself as he went back to his room. Now is the time to act, I must not let the opportunity escape me. He went to a lamp maker's shop which also sold lamps. Master, he said, I need a dozen copper lamps can you supply me with them? The lamp maker told him he did not have a dozen but, if he would be patient and wait until the following day, he could let him have the whole lot whenever he wanted. The magician agreed to this and asked that the lamps be clean and well polished, and after promising him to pay him well, he returned to the con. The next day, the twelve lamps were delivered to the magician who gave the lamp maker the price he had asked for, without bargaining. He put them in a basket which he had specially acquired and, with this on his arm, he went to Aladdin's palace. When he drew near, he began to cry out. Old lamps for new. As he approached, the children playing in the square heard him from a distance and rushed up and gathered around him, loudly jeering at him, for they took him for a madman. The passers-by, too, laughed at what they thought was his stupidity. He must have lost his mind, they said, to offer to exchange old lamps for new ones. But the magician was not surprised by the children's jeers nor by what people were saying about him, and he continued to cry out to sell his wares. Old lamps for new. He repeated this cry so often as he went to and fro in front of and around the palace that Princess Badr, who was at that point in the room with the twenty-four windows, hearing a man's voice crying out something but unable to make out what he was saying because of the jeers of the children who followed him and who kept increasing in number, sent down one of her slave girls to go up to him and see what he was shouting. The slave girl was not long in returning and entered the room in fits of laughter. Her mirth was so infectious that the princess, looking at her, could not stop herself from laughing too. Well, you crazy girl, she said, tell me why you are laughing. Still laughing, the slave replied. Oh princess, who couldn't stop himself laughing at the sight of a madman with a basket on his arm full of brand new lamps wanting not to sell them but to change them for old ones. It's the children, crowding around him so that he can hardly move and jeering at him, who are making all the noise. Hearing this, another slave girl interrupted. Speaking of old lamps, I don't know if the princess has observed that there is an old lamp on the cornice. Whoever owns it won't be cross to find a new one in its place. If the princess would like, she can have the pleasure of finding out whether this madman is really mad enough to exchange a new lamp for an old one without asking anything for it in return. The lamp the slave girl was talking about was the magic lamp Aladdin had used to raise himself to his present high state. He himself had put it on the cornice before going out to hunt, for fear of losing it, a precaution he had taken on all previous occasions. Up until now, neither the slave girls, nor the eunuchs,
nor even the princess herself had paid any attention to it during his absence, for apart from when he went out hunting, Aladdin always carried it on him. One may say that Aladdin was right to take this precaution, but he ought at least to have locked up the lamp. Mistakes like this, it is true, are always being made and always will be. The princess, unaware how precious the lamp was and that it was in Aladdin's great interest, not to mention her own, that no one should ever touch it and that it should be kept safe, entered into the joke. She ordered a eunuch to take the lamp and go and exchange it. The eunuch obeyed and went down from the room, and no sooner had he emerged from the palace gate when he saw the magician. He called out to him from the palace gate when he saw the magician. He called out to him and, when he came up, he showed him the old lamp, saying, Give me a new lamp for this one here. The magician was in no doubt that this was the lamp he was looking for there could be no other lamp like it in Aladdin's palace, where all the plates and dishes were either of gold or silver. He promptly took it from the eunuch's hand and, after he had stowed it safely away in his cloak, he showed him his basket and told him to choose whichever lamp he fancied. The eunuch picked one, left the magician and took the new lamp to the princess. As soon as the exchange had taken place, the square rang out again with the shouts and jeers of the children, who laughed even more loudly than before at what they took to be the magician's stupidity. The magician let the children jeer at him, but not wanting to stay any longer in the vicinity of Aladdin's palace, he gradually and quietly moved away. He stopped crying out about changing new lamps for old, for the only lamp he wanted was the one now in his possession. Seeing his silence, the children lost interest and left him to go on his way. As soon as he was out of the square between the two palaces, the magician escaped through the less frequented streets and, when he saw there was nobody about, he set the basket down in the middle of one, since he no longer had a use for either the lamps or the basket. He then slipped down another street and hastened on until he came to one of the city gates. As he made his way through the suburbs, which were extensive, he bought some provisions before leaving them. Once in the countryside, he left the road and went to a spot out of sight of passers-by, where he stayed a while until he judged the moment was right for him to carry out the plan which had brought him there. He did not regret the Barbary horse he had left behind at the con where he had taken lodgings for he reckoned that the treasure he had acquired was fair compensation for its loss. The magician spent the rest of the day in this spot until night was at its darkest. He then pulled out the lamp from under his cloak and rubbed it. Thus summoned, the genie appeared. What is your wish? it asked him. Here am I, ready to obey you, your slave and the slave of all those who hold the lamp, I and the other slaves. I command you, replied the magician, this very instant to remove the palace that the other slaves of the lamp have built in this city, just as it is, with all the people in it, and transport it and at the same time myself to such and such a place in Africa. Without answering him, the genie, with the assistance of other jinn, like him slaves of the lamp, transported the magician and the entire palace in a very short time to the place in Africa he had designated where we will leave him, the palace and Princess Badr, and describe, instead, the Sultan's surprise. As soon as the Sultan had arisen, as was his custom he went to his closet window in order to have the pleasure of gazing on and admiring Aladdin's palace. But when he looked in the direction of where he had been accustomed to see this palace, all he could see was an empty space, such as had been before the palace had been built. Believing himself mistaken, he rubbed his eyes, but still saw nothing, although the weather was fine, the sky clear and the dawn, which was just breaking, had made everything sharp and distinct. He looked through the two windows on the right and on the left but could only see what he had been used to seeing out of them. So great was his astonishment that he remained for a long time in the same spot his eyes turned towards where the palace had stood but was now no longer to be seen. He could not understand how so large and striking a palace as Aladdin's, 
which he had seen as recently as the previous day and almost every day since he had given permission to build it, had vanished so completely that no trace was left behind. I am not wrong, he said to himself. It was there. If it had tumbled down, the materials would be there in heaps, and if the earth had swallowed it up, then there would be some trace to show that had happened. Although he was convinced that the palace was no more, he nonetheless waited a little longer to see if, in fact, he was mistaken. At last he withdrew and, after taking one final look before leaving, he returned to his room. There he commanded the Grand Vizier to be summoned in all haste and sat down, his mind so disturbed with conflicting thoughts that he did not know what he should do. The Vizier did not keep the Sultan waiting long, in fact, he came in such great haste that neither he nor his officials noticed as they came that Aladdin's palace was no longer there, nor had the doorkeepers, when they opened the palace gates, noticed its disappearance. When he came up to the Sultan, the vizier addressed him. Sire, the urgency with which your majesty has summoned me makes me think that something most extraordinary has happened, since you are well aware that today is the day the council meets and that I must shortly go and carry out my duties. What has happened is indeed truly extraordinary, as you will agree. Tell me, where is Aladdin's palace? asked the sultan. Aladdin's palace? replied the vizier in astonishment. I have just passed in front of it I thought it was there. Buildings as solid as that don't disappear so easily. Go and look through my closet window, said the sultan, and then come and tell me if you can see it then come and tell me if you can see it. The grand vizier went to the closet, and the same thing happened to him as had happened to the sultan. When he had quite convinced himself that Aladdin's palace no longer stood where it had been and that there did not appear to be any trace of it, he returned to the Sultan. Well, did you see Aladdin's palace? the Sultan asked him. Sire, he replied, your majesty may remember that I had the honor to tell you that this palace, which was the subject of your admiration, with all its immense riches, was the result of magic, the work of a magician, but your majesty would not listen to this. The sultan, unable to disagree with what the vizier had said, flew into a great rage which was all the greater because he could not deny his incredulity. Where is this wretch, this impostor? he cried. Bring him at once so that I can have his head chopped off. Sire, replied the vizier, he took leave of your majesty a few days ago we must send for him and ask him about his palace he must know where it is. That would be to treat him too leniently, go and order thirty of my horsemen to bring him to me bound in chains, commanded the sultan. The vizier went off to give the sultan's order to the horsemen, instructing their officer in what manner to take Aladdin so that he did not escape. They set out and met Aladdin five or six miles outside the city, hunting on his return. The officer went up to him and told him that the sultan, in his impatience to see him, had sent them to inform him and to accompany him back. Aladdin, who had not the slightest suspicion of the real reason which brought this detachment of the sultan's guard, continued to hunt but, when he was only half a league from the city, this detachment surrounded him and the officer addressed him. Prince Aladdin, it is with the greatest regret that we have to inform you of the order of the Sultan the greatest regret that we have to inform you of the order of the Sultan to arrest you and bring you to him as a criminal of the state. We beg you not to think ill of us for carrying out our duty and we hope you will forgive us. Aladdin, who believed himself innocent, was very much surprised at this announcement and asked the officer if he knew of what crime he was accused to which the officer answered that neither he nor his men knew anything about it. When he saw how few his own men were compared to the horsemen in the detachment and how they were now moving away from him, he dismounted. Here I am, he said. Carry out your order. I have to say, though, that I don't believe I am guilty of any crime, either against the sultan himself or against the state. A very long, long, 
thick chain was immediately passed around his neck and tied around his body in such a manner as to bind his arms. Then the officer went ahead to lead the detachment, while a horseman took the end of the chain and, following the officer, led Aladdin, who was forced to follow him on foot. In this manner, Aladdin was led towards the city. When the horsemen entered the outskirts, the first people who saw Aladdin being led as a criminal were convinced he was going to have his head chopped off. As he was held in general affection, some took hold of their swords or other weapons, while those who had no weapons armed themselves with stones, and they followed the detachment. Some horsemen in the rear turned round to face the people as though to disperse them, but the crowd quickly grew to such an extent that the horsemen decided on a stratagem, being concerned to get as far as the Sultan's palace without Aladdin being snatched from them. To succeed in this, they took great care to take up the entire street as they passed, now spreading out, now closing up again, according to whether the street was broad or narrow. In this way, they reached the palace square, where they all drew themselves up in a line facing the armed populace, until their officer and the horsemen who led Aladdin had entered the palace and the doorkeepers had shut the gate to stop the people entering. Aladdin was led before the Sultan who was waiting for him on the balcony, accompanied by the Grand Vizier. As soon as he saw him, the Sultan immediately commanded the executioner, whom he had ordered to be present, to chop off his head, without wanting to listen to Aladdin or receive an explanation from him. The executioner seized Aladdin and removed the chain which he had around his neck and body. On the ground he spread a leather mat stained with the blood of the countless criminals he had executed and made him kneel on it before tying a bandage over his eyes. He then drew his sword, sized him up before administering the blow and, after flourishing the sword in the air three times, sat down, waiting for the sultan to give the signal to cut off Aladdin's head. At that moment, the grand vizier noticed that the crowd, who had broken through the horsemen and filled the square, were scaling the palace walls in several places and were beginning to demolish them in an attempt to breach them. Before the Sultan could give the signal to the executioner, the vizier said to him, Sire, I beseech your majesty to reflect carefully on what you are about to do. You will run the risk of seeing your palace stormed, and should such a disaster occur, the outcome could be fatal. My palace stormed, exclaimed the Sultan. Who would be so bold? Sire, replied the vizier, if your majesty were to cast a glance towards the walls of your palace and towards the square, you would discover the truth of what I say would discover the truth of what I say. On seeing the excited and animated mob, the sultan was so terror-stricken that he instantly commanded the executioner to put away his sword in its sheath and to remove the bandage from Aladdin's eyes and let him go free. He also ordered the guards to proclaim that the sultan was pardoning him and that everyone should go away. As a result, all the men who had already climbed on top of the palace walls, seeing what had happened, now abandoned their plan. They very quickly climbed down and, filled with joy at having saved the life of a man they truly loved, they spread the news to everyone around them and from there it soon spread to all the crowd assembled in the palace square. And when the guards proclaimed the same thing from the top of the terraces to which they had climbed, it became known to all. The justice the Sultan had done Aladdin by pardoning him pacified the mob, the tumult died down and gradually everyone went home. Finding himself free, Aladdin looked up at the balcony and, seeing the Sultan, cried out in an affecting manner to him. Sire! I beseech your majesty to add one more favor to the one you have already granted me and to let me know what crime I have committed. Crime. You don't know your crime, exclaimed the sultan. Come up here and I'll show you. Aladdin went up onto the balcony, where the sultan told him to follow him, and without looking back, led him to his closet. When he reached the door, the sultan turned to him, saying, enter. You ought to know where your palace stood, look all around and then tell me what has happened to it. Aladdin looked and saw nothing. 
he could see the whole area which his palace had occupied but, having no idea how the palace could have disappeared, this extraordinary event put him into palace could have disappeared, this extraordinary event put him into such a state of confusion that in his astonishment he could not utter a single word in reply. Go on, tell me where your palace is and where is my daughter, the sultan repeated impatiently. Aladdin broke his silence, saying. Sire, I see very well and have to admit that the palace I built is no longer where it was. I see that it has disappeared but I cannot tell your majesty where it can be. I can assure you, however, that I had no part in this. I am not so concerned about what happened to your palace, the sultan continued. My daughter is a million times more valuable to me and I want you to find her for me, otherwise I will cut off your head and nothing will stop me. Sire, replied Aladdin, I beg your majesty to grant me forty days grace to do all I can, and if in that time I don't succeed in finding her, I give you my word that I will offer my head at the foot of your throne so you can dispose of it as you please. I grant you the forty days you ask for, answered the Sultan, but don't think to abuse this favor by believing you can escape my anger, for I will know how to find you, in whatever corner of the earth you may be. Aladdin left the Sultan, deeply humiliated and in a truly pitiful state. With head bowed, he passed through the palace courtyards without daring to raise his eyes in his confusion. Of the chief court officials, whom he had treated graciously and who had been his friends, not one for all their friendship went up to him to console him or to offer to take him in, but they turned their backs on him as much to avoid seeing him as to avoid being recognized by him. But even had they gone up to Aladdin to say something consoling to him or to offer to help him, they would not have known him for he no longer knew himself, being no longer in his right mind. This was evident when he came out of the palace as, without thinking what he was doing, he went from door to door and asked passers-by, inquiring of them whether they had seen his palace or could give him any news of it. Consequently, everyone became convinced that Aladdin had gone out of his mind. Some only laughed, but the more reasonable, and in particular those linked to him either by friendship or business, were filled with compassion. He stayed three days in the city walking hither and thither and only eating what people offered him out of charity unable to decide what to do. Finally, in the wretched state he was in and feeling he could no longer stay in a city where he had once cut such a fine figure, he left and went out into the countryside. Avoiding the main roads and after crossing several fields in a state of great uncertainty, eventually, at nightfall, he came to the bank of a river. There, greatly despondent, he said to himself. Where shall I go to look for my palace? In which province, which country, or part of the world shall I find it and recover my dear princess, as the sultan demands of me? I will never succeed. It's best if I don't go to all of this wearisome effort, which will in any case come to nothing, but free myself of all this bitter grief that torments me. Having made this resolution, he was on the point of throwing himself into the river but, being a good and faithful Muslim, he thought he ought not to do this before first performing his prayers. Wishing to prepare himself, he approached the river in order to wash his hands and face according to custom, but as the bank sloped at that point and was damp from the water lapping against it, he slipped and would have fallen into the river had he not been stopped by a small rock which protruded about two feet above the ground. Fortunately for him, he was still wearing the ring which the magician had put on his finger before he had gone down into the cave to remove the precious lamp that had now been taken away from him. As he caught hold of the rock, he rubbed the ring quite hard against it and immediately the same genie who had first appeared to him in the cave in which the magician had shut him up appeared once again, saying. What is your wish? Here am I, ready to obey you, your slave and the slave of all those who wear the ring on their finger, I and the other slaves of the ring. Delighted at this apparition, which he had so little expected in his despair, Aladdin replied. 
Save me a second time, Jenny, and either tell me where the palace I built is or bring it back immediately to where it was. What you ask of me, replied the Jenny, is not within my power to bring back, I am only the slave of the ring. You must address yourself to the slave of the lamp. If that's the case, said Aladdin, I command you, by the power of the ring, to transport me to the place where my palace is, wherever it is in the world, and set me down underneath the windows of Princess Badr. Hardly had he finished speaking than the genie transported him to Africa, to the middle of a meadow where the palace stood, not far from a large town, and set him down right underneath the windows of the princess's apartments, where he left him. All this happened in a moment. Despite the darkness of the night, Aladdin easily recognized his palace and the princess's apartments, but as the night was already advanced and all was quiet in the palace, he moved off a little way and sat down at the foot of a tree. There, filled with hope as he reflected on the pure chance to which he owed his good fortune, he found himself in a much more peaceful state than he had been in since the time when he had been arrested and brought before the Sultan and had been delivered from the recent danger of losing his life. For a while he entertained himself with these agreeable thoughts but eventually, not having slept at all for five or six days, he could not stop himself being overwhelmed by sleep and fell asleep at the foot of the tree where he was sitting. The next morning, as dawn was breaking, Aladdin was pleasantly awoken by the singing of the birds, not only those that roosted on the tree beneath which he had spent the night but all those on the luxuriant trees in the very garden of his palace. When he cast his eyes on that wonderful building, he felt a joy beyond words at the thought that he would soon be its master once more and possess once again his dear princess. He got up and, approaching the princess's apartments, walked for a while underneath her windows until it was light and he could see her. As he waited, he searched his mind for a possible cause for his misfortune, and after much thought he became convinced that it all came from his having left the lamp out of his sight. He blamed himself for his negligence and his carelessness in letting it leave his possession for a single moment. What worried him still more was that he could not imagine who could be so jealous as to envy him his good fortune. He would have soon guessed had he known that such a man and his palace were both in Africa, but the slave of the ring had not mentioned this, while he himself had not even asked about it. The name of Africa alone should have reminded him of the magician, his avowed enemy. That morning, Princess Badra arose earlier than she had done ever since the wily magician now the master of the palace the sight of whom she had been forced to endure once a day but whom she treated so harshly that he had not yet been so bold as to take up residence there so harshly that he had not yet been so bold as to take up residence there had by his cunning kidnapped her and carried her off to Africa. Audiobook generated by, Read With The Ears